We're happy to have James Cooley here. He, uh, he got his degree in physics from this fine institution uh, in 2001, and then uh, where he worked at JPL on various plasma thruster technologies, and then he went to Princeton to continue the thruster work with uh, designing some novel um, techniques for pulse plasma thrusters. And uh, then he uh, moved to the R&D division of Agilent, working on mass spectrometry and designing uh, uh, new forefront machines for precision chemistry, and then went from there to designing uh, medical devices, in particular uh, compact proton accelerators, and uh, that's what he's going to talk to us to uh, talk to us about today. So, take it away. All right. Uh, you guys hear me okay? All right. So, thank you very much. Uh, it's a huge honor to be here. As you mentioned, uh, I went through the physics undergrad here in this very department. Took a lot of classes right here in this room, so it's uh, it's really it's really quite a thrill for me to come back and, and be standing on the, on this side of the bench. Um, so, um, uh, as you mentioned, compact proton therapy. Uh, I'm talking about a cancer treatment technique. Uh, I work. Uh, uh, I'm gonna start here actually with. Uh, my disclosure slide, I wanted to say uh, just a few things about this. I am an employee of a private company. It's called Mevion Medical Systems, based out of Littleton, Massachusetts. Um, uh, we're a commercial venture trying to sell proton machines. Uh, but I did want to say that this talk I put together is not meant to be a commercial talk. I'm not trying to sell anybody anything, uh, although if you do have $20 million to spend and you want to buy a proton therapy system, you know, see me after. But <laughs> Um, um, I didn't show the slides to the marketing department or anything like that. I did steal some of their slides, so if you see some fancy graphics, uh, that's probably where that came from. But um, I just want to make it clear that I'm not here to uh, try to convince you to buy a Mevion machine. I'm not here to trash my competitors uh, or anything like that. that uh, I'm going to talk about as much as I can about the industry in general. Um, although that being said, the thing I am most qualified to talk about is my own story and the story of my company. So you'll see me drawing some comparisons, uh, but it, I hope that people understand that's taken in the, in the, the spirit of, of collaboration, really. Uh, so here's another one, uh, cancer. What can you say about cancer? Um, I actually spent a, probably too much time thinking about what to put on this slide. I think uh, we all know uh, what cancer is and how horrible it can be, uh, just in general. What cancer is the abnormal growth of the body's own cells. It's a genetic uh, malfunction, uh, a, a mal malfunction in the uh, regulation mechanisms that regulate cell growth. Um, I put some kind of important statistics up there. One in six people will die of cancer, something like 16%. Uh, the costs uh, of dealing with cancer are in the trillions. Uh, but in a larger sense, uh, this is a horrible disease that probably affects just about everybody one way or another, I imagine. Everyone in this room uh, either knows someone who's been through it or has been through it themselves. Um, and and um, uh, what the, the spirit of this talk is really about what is it that we can do to give more people more access to better treatments uh, in ways that improves their quality of life. Um, so how do you cure cancer? Lots of people have been working on it really hard for a really long time. Um, and while much progress has been made, there's still a lot of work to do, and that's because curing cancer is really hard. So this quote uh, I read in a book, uh, and it has stuck with me for a long time, and I think it kind of frames the, uh, frames the problem a little bit. Uh, so those who have not been trained in chemistry or medicine may not realize how difficult the problem of cancer treatment really is. Uh, it is almost, not quite, but almost as hard as finding some agent that will dissolve away the left ear, but leave the right ear unharmed. So slight is the difference between the cancer cell and its normal ancestor. So uh, the, there's a lot of techniques to treat cancer. Uh, it's really, what makes it fundamentally a difficult thing is that it's really your own cells that are just doing the wrong thing, uh, really at a cellular level. Uh, it's not a foreign in invading agent. It's not an organ that's acting up that can be replaced with some external thing. You, you, if you're going to treat cancer, you need to find something that generates a differential response, something that understands the difference between a cancer cell and a healthy cell. And these four pictures are meant to represent the sort of four legs uh, of cancer treatment today. Uh, and often when someone is diagnosed with cancer, they will get one or several of these uh, in combination. So obviously chemotherapy, um, which is uh, you're given sort of small molecule drugs, which are basically and literally uh, poison uh, that happen to be more poisonous to your cancer cells 
than they are to the rest of your body. And you are given as much of this as you can tolerate, uh, often in several cycles, uh, until the cancer shrinks. Uh, surgery um, is a very manual way to differentiate between cancer cells and normal cells when you can see the difference and you can get in there and cut it out with a knife. Uh, radiation therapy is what I'll be spending the rest of the, the time talking about, but the idea here is that you do, in fact, get a differential response when you irradiate someone. And then uh, the newer one, which uh, I found this picture on Google Images, um, uh, this is immunotherapy, uh, where you actually use the body's own immune system uh, to, to develop molecules that actually do understand the difference uh, between a cancer cell and a healthy cell. Uh, I'm not a biologist, but this is, this is really a, this is a hot topic these days. Um, and is becoming a established uh, uh, treatment modality. So let's talk about radiation. Um, uh, it is, in fact, bad for you. It can, in fact, cause cancer. Uh, the mechanism by which people, uh, uh, by which cells are damaged by radiation is about uh, damage to the DNA, either through direct interaction uh, with the radioactive photons or particles, or very commonly through secondary interactions where you create uh, free radicals like uh, oxygen radicals, and those do damage to the DNA. Uh, once the DNA is damaged, uh, further generations of cells uh, 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 mutate and are less likely to grow or die. Uh, the important thing here is uh, radiation is bad for every cell in your body. I think uh, obviously people can get sick and die from radiation. They can even get cancer. But um, it's worse for the cancer cells than it is for the healthy cells. Uh, and this is actually for a number of complicated reasons, and again, I am not a biologist. I think one important factor is this idea that one of the big things that differentiates cancer cells and healthy cells is that cancer cells grow faster, uh, and that means that they spend a larger fraction of their life uh, in the phase of their life cycle where they're splitting and uh, dividing their DNA apart, and it's during this stage of their life uh, that the DNA is more vulnerable. Um, so... Uh, this image on the lower left here is to represent uh, the dose distribution for what's called whole body radiation, which is to say that even though radiation is bad for healthy cells, uh, it's worse for cancer cells. So if you find a uh, sick patient and you just irradiate their entire body, uh, you actually can be doing them some good. Uh, certain types of cancer, uh, leukemia, for example, you might be getting a treatment like this. But... Um, even better is if you can localize the radiation to the tumor tissue uh, and spare the healthy tissue. Um, and that's where a lot of different types of radiation therapy come in. Uh, these are all different examples of stuff that's really out there today treating patients all the time. Um, on the upper left there, this is an x-ray LINAC, and I would say this is the bread and butter uh, of conventional radiation therapy uh, using MV x-rays to um, and complicated collimation schemes to um, uh, tailor the dose distribution to the tumor itself. Uh, but there's other things that pe people do out there. This one is a cartoon of a technique called gamma knife, uh, where you use uh, radioactive sources, cobalt-60, and uh, complicated collimation schemes to direct several intersecting beams of radiation to the tumor. Uh, the one on the lower left is brachytherapy, where you actually implant radioactive elements directly into the tumor. Um, and leave them there for a short period of time and take them out. And then on the bottom, we'll see this image again. Uh, this is proton therapy. Uh, and this is the field I work in and the technology we're trying to advance. Um, so um, every talk about proton therapy starts with a slide like this. We have to talk about the Bragg peak. So uh, what makes protons attractive for radiation therapy um, is the promise of conformality, which means the ability to target your radiation to the tumor. Uh, and that comes from this, it's the Bragg peak. So protons uh, go to a certain depth. They, de they de deposit a little bit of dose on the way in uh, because as they, as they enter with high energy, there's a certain kind of uh, interaction, mostly uh, Coulomb interactions with bound electrons in the, in the target medium. Uh, when they slow down to a certain critical amount, uh, the, th the cross-section for nuclear interactions gets high enough. The protons deposit all their energy at nuclear uh, interactions, and then there's no more energy, and they stop. So the idea here is some dose on the way in, a lot of dose at a certain depth, which we can control, no dose on the way out. Um, and this 2D color map down here shows, I think, a little more detail than sometimes you see that, in fact, the Bragg peak is, is a, a two-dimensional phenomenon uh, with complicated dose distributions that uh, you have to consider. Uh, and then uh, this slide also always shows up in any talk about proton therapy. It's comparing... 
uh, protons to those x-rays, which I said are really the bread and butter conventional therapy. The idea here is if you irradiate someone with photons, uh, you get more absorption and uh, with more depth. Um, and so if your tumor is at a certain depth, you necessarily must deliver more dose upstream of that tumor. Um, so uh, this slide is, is meant to contrast the effect of the Bragg peak with the effect of a proton uh, of a photon dose distribution. So imagine you had uh, a tumor at a certain depth. That's this that's this orange block, peach block, um, and you wanted to irradiate it to a certain level. In this case, 100 percent. And uh, you also had an organ at risk, like your brain stem or something downstream of it. If you're going to do it with photons. What's coming in upstream is getting way more than 100% of the dose, and then what's downstream is getting a, still a significant fraction. With protons, you not only use a Bragg peak at a certain depth, you actually use a whole series of them, uh, add it up uh, in decreasing intensity as you go shallower uh, to make a nice flat depth, or a nice flat dose distribution that completely, that uh, conforms to the tumor uh, uniformly, and then upstream of that you have still some dose but less than on the way in. Uh, this, this dose distribution is called a spread out Bragg peak, and I think you can see why. But the idea here is that you have to account for the entry dose from deeper beams as you introduce shallower beams to add up to a uniform dose distribution. Um, uh, and so when doing uh, proton treatments this way, you get better dose distribution. So here's just a couple of examples. There's a million of these you can find comparing photon dose distributions to protons. But in this case, we want to, say, irradiate this patient's entire spine and brain uh, with radiation. And on the left, that's what you would get if you brought in uh, an X-ray dose. Uh, and you can see the green color map that washes all over this person's heart and lungs and liver. Uh, but if you come in with protons, you can irradiate their brain, go directly into their spine, have the beam stop, and get zero dose at all uh, in the rest of their organs. This is another, uh, another example looking at uh, uh, something in the brain cavity that completely spares all this extra dose you would be getting um, from the, uh, uh, into the brain. So um, protons uh, always work as well as photons in every case. In many cases, uh, they work better because they spare the healthy tissue and uh, eliminate and reduce uh, side effects. Most commonly, we see protons used for head and neck cancers. Uh, this is a cerebrospinal. Uh, gastrointestinal, prostate uh, in men very common, in breast in women very common, and lung, but especially pediatrics, kids with cancer, uh, and that's because uh, for several reasons, uh, kids are especially sensitive to radiation uh, as they're growing, as their brain develops. Uh, they also have a long life ahead of them, hopefully, uh, and a lot of chance to get secondary cancer, so we want to spare, um, uh, spare as much extra radiation as possible. And some of our sites, as many as 30% of the patients are, are children. Pediatric cases. Uh, what, what this 83% that it, it all has to do with whether or not there's a sensitive organ nearby that you're sparing. So some some tumors are just in locations that are a little less sensitive. And like I said, in some cases, we just irradiate the whole body because that's that's the appropriate uh, technique for that, or the whole brain. Uh, and this is just an example of some of the what they call reductions in toxicities or side effects uh, that you see you get by using protons instead of photons. And these are all some horrible things like having to use a feeding tube for the rest of your life, uh, uh, having lung complications like ability to difficult, uh, difficulty breathing, uh, incontinence, and stuff like that. Um, so proton therapy uh, is a, a technology that we would like to get out to as many p cancer patients who need it as possible. Um, but as, at the moment, it's still kind of a niche thing, and I'll talk about that uh, more in a bit. But just before we get to that, uh, we talked about the Bragg Peak, and I wanted to go in a little detail about how you go from a single Bragg Peak into building up a complicated three-dimensional dose distribution, because, of course, a tumor is not a single point in your body, nor is it a perfect sphere like this is, but it's a complicated three-dimensional shape that lives in a complicated environment of varying density. So. Uh, I'm also, in a, mi in a minute, going to talk about drastically changing the design of a proton therapy machine. And I want people to keep in mind that you still have to maintain the ability to do these four things. So in order to build a proton treatment, you have to control beam energy, the direction or directionality or the placement of an individual Bragg Peak spot, the intensity or, or weight of that spot, 
uh, and the angle with which the whole beam comes in. Um, so to build a proton treatment, the first thing you need is an accelerator. Uh, uh, in the field today, uh, and historically speaking, most of these out there are cyclotrons. Uh, these are two, uh, two examples here of what was kind of the state of the art uh, before um, compact therapy came along. There are a handful of synchrotrons out there as well. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me why the industry sort of went to cyclotrons instead of synchrotrons. I do work for a cyclotron company, so maybe I'm a little biased. Synchrotrons seem a little more complicated uh, and expensive to me, but uh, it may just be a fluke of the way the business went. But it just here's some numbers to kind of keep in mind. You need a 230 MeV proton beam. 230 MeV is the uh, energy you, you need to get to 32 centimeters of depth in water, which people have decided is about, I guess, halfway through the largest patient you're likely to find. Uh, delivered to the treatment room, uh, you need, on average, about a nanoamp of beam current, although within that uh, treatment, you might have a dynamic range of maybe a factor of 10 in terms of some places being hotter than others. Uh, but often, because beam lines and especially energy selection systems are very inefficient, that means you need hundreds of nanoamps coming out of the accelerator. Um, so um, one thing you need to control is beam energy. This sets the depth uh, in water that the beam will, will go to. Uh, typically what you do um, uh, is you divide your treatment into specific energy layers. Uh, so you, layers of constant energy. Uh, you deliver all of the beam to that energy. Uh, you change the energy, you deliver it to a different layer. Uh, this is because typically the changing the layers, the energy layers, is the slowest thing in the system, and so it's kind of most efficient to paint this up layer by layer, um, kind of like a 3D printer. Um, what I should say is the technique I'm describing is what I would call the modern state-of-the-art in terms of beam delivery. It's called pencil beam scanning or intensity modulated proton therapy, IMPT. And if you buy a proton machine today, you'll certainly get a, a scanning machine. Although if you were to get treated on a proton machine today, there's a good chance it would be the previous generation double scattering where you make a one big uniform beam and, and blast the whole tumor. But what I'm talking about today is IMPT. So uh, how you change the energy historically uh, is using what's called an energy selection system, which basically amounts to a degrader you put in the beam. Uh, cyclotrons typically don't have a knob on the side of them that allows you to change the energy. They're built for one energy and one energy only. So if you're going to change the energy, you have to do it downstream. Uh, this is conceptually quite easy. Uh, if the beam was going to stop in 32 centimeters of water coming out of the machine, you put something in it that accounts for a little less than 32 centimeters and the beam will stop shallower. Uh, however, if you have a long beam line where you're trying to pipe the beam down into a treatment room far away, you can't just put material in the beam and degrade it because the beam will scatter uh, and lose its quality, so you also have to condition the beam. So these energy selection systems basically amount to uh, a monochromator where you degrade the beam to a certain energy, uh, you have a right angle bending magnet on a series of collimators and slits to select out the protons um, that are the energy that you want. And as a result, they're inherently inefficient, uh, less than a percent often. Um, and these, you end up throwing away the vast majority of your protons here uh, in the accelerator room, um, which is why the accelerators need to be so big and the, um, the rooms get so uh, radioactive. Uh, and also uh, a complicated series of magnetic optics have to be ramped up and down every time you change the energy, which is why energy, energy switching is slow. Uh, spot placement and weight. So you go to a, you, you put your beam at a certain energy layer. Uh, you use a scanning magnet to steer the beam to a different location. Uh, you use techniques to uh, either from the, acceler from the accelerator to adjust the intensity of the beam at that location, uh, and you put different spots of different weights uh, building up uh, a, a map of spots uh, at each layer. So uh, the promise of intensity modulated proton therapy is that you can have a three-dimensional volume of spots of all different intensity and make any shape you want. Um, so putting that together, uh, this is just what it looks like if we tried to make a sphere treatment. So this is the dose distribution. You're trying to get a perfect sphere. The beam comes in this way. Of course, you can't get zero entry dose with a proton beam. Uh, but what you do is you, you divide this volume into energy layers. Each layer gets its own uh, spot map. Uh, the deepest layers in the center get the hottest spots. As you move outward, you'll see that you get cooler spots in the middle because you've already gotten uh, entry dose uh, from the deeper layers. It's maybe a little easier to see on this one, which looks like a cone. As we go out, 
you see we've, we've got a lot. We don't need to fill in the middle because we've already got the entry dose from the deeper layers. Uh, what you're looking at here, by the way, is a screenshot from a piece of software called Treatment Planning, uh, which is a complicated optimization and dose calculation software involving a Monte Carlo dose engine, which uh, takes in the patient's CT scans, takes in criteria from a doctor saying this tumor is supposed to get this much dose and this organ is supposed to get no more than this much dose, optimizes exactly where the spot should be, uh, calculates exactly what dose you're going to get. Uh, it's an, a critical part of any radiation therapy uh, system. Uh, spheres and uh, cones are easy to look at. Uh, a real clinical plan uh, is very hard to understand. Uh, it looks like kind of a mess, but keep in mind that what we're doing here is we're going, shooting a beam into a patient. We're passing through some bone in some places, some empty space in some places, um, and uh, trying to map our dose to a really complicated three-dimensional shape. Uh, one, and by the way, you don't actually get to look at what the dose looks like in the patient once you're delivering it. The best you can do is go in ahead of time, deliver it to a water tank, uh, measure it as best you can, and compare the dose you measure to what the, what the treatment planning system calculates to verify that you are delivering what you think you're delivering. And that's what this is. This is a comparison between uh, the predicted and measured dose of that treatment plan. Uh, yes. It's mostly about shifting around these Bragg peaks, right? So, like, the Bragg peak is going to go to a certain depth and stop, and if you're passing through bone, it's not going to go as far. So, the entry dose looks pretty flat for any one Bragg peak. So, uh, if you change the density, you might you'll move it further down or further up. Um, but the actual dose you get there won't matter so much. But what matters more is downstream. Yeah. So that yeah, that's exactly right. So that's what this is meant to show here. Is that this? You can see this guy's ribs. You can see uh, you know the the you you take a full three-dimensional CAT scan, CT scan, and you have to know uh, not just what he looks like, not just where the tumor is. You have to know the proton stopping power of every bit of tissue that you're going to pass through on your way in. Um, and, that's, and that's complicated math to do that. Um, and, and physics, too, because you, you've scanned them with x-rays, not with protons, and they're not quite the same thing. Um, so this one seems a little straightforward, but in fact um, leads to like a big part of the size and complexity of a proton treatment. Uh, this is field angles, so not only are we uh, going to deliver a certain spot map from a certain beam, but if imagine this green blob here is your L-shaped tumor. Uh, no one beam is going to do a good job of treating it if you're trying to prevent this gray thing from, uh, from uh, like say that's your brain, from getting dosed. So you would combine multiple beams from multiple angles to totally cover the treatment. Um, and like I said, this doesn't seem like a big deal. Uh, sure, we'll shoot them a little bit this way and we'll shoot them a little bit that way. Uh, but this gets into how you get uh, access to the patient from the four pi steradian angles. And the way this is done is through a combination of uh, a gantry where you take your beam line and wrap it around the gantry so that the beam can be delivered from any of uh, either 360 degrees or, or 180 degrees. And you put the patient on a six degree of freedom couch, robotic uh, bed, uh, that positions the patient relative to the beam so that the, in the combination of these two things, you can get any angle you want. Um, so these gantries end up getting pretty big. You need one for every treatment room, um, and they um, tend to drive the cost and complexity of the system. So circa 2013 or so, before compact proton therapy came along, this is what a conventional proton uh, facility looked like. You had a big accelerator in one room. You had a beam line here. Uh, this right angle bend would be the energy selection system. You would have multiple treatment rooms. Uh, that's partially to make the economics work if you're spending a ton of money uh, to build a big accelerator. Um, and by building, uh, you try to get m m more treatment rooms into that building uh, to benefit from economy of scale. Each one of these gantries is a several, is like a three story building. Um, and um, you can kind of see the beam line rotating up around here and directing down onto the patient. That's the patient couch here. Um, so, how, how long does the patient uh, normally stay in this? So you go typically you go every day, every weekday for about six weeks, and depending on uh, how complicated your treatment is, you would you would have a 
a time slot between 15 minutes and maybe 30, 45 minutes, something like that. Uh, here's an aerial photograph of uh, one of these treatment facilities. Uh, you can see where the accelerator room is going to be. This is obviously under construction. You can see where the uh, three, three of the gantry rooms are going to be. This, down here often you have one fixed beam room with no gantry where the, the beam just comes out of the wall and you can position someone right into the wall for beams that happen to come from that angle. For scale, notice that this is a cement mixer uh, and this is a really big facility. Uh, such a facility is a, a large uh, price tag in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And while I don't exactly have a square footage for you, the words we often use to describe a facility is like that is an entire city block uh, or a building the size of a Home Depot or a football field. So these are massive facilities uh, and that require huge capital investments. And as a result, there weren't so many of them. Uh, this is a map of every running proton therapy center circa 2013 when the first compact system came online. There were 10 of them in the U.S., uh, pretty much all of them were in major urban centers at large research hospitals. Uh, so you could, if you had access to Massachusetts General Hospital or MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, you might be able to get a proton treatment. If you're willing to travel, you might be able to get a proton treatment. But this is largely an inaccessible niche technology available only to a small fraction of uh, patients. Uh, and there's some pictures of the, the huge uh, huge, huge kinds of facilities that would support uh, support such a large facility. To build a, if you build a large four-room facility like that, you also need a, a large patient load to keep it occupied, uh, to, keep the, to, to keep the business running. So someone, you notice there's not too many in California. There's not too many in the, in the Mountain West. Uh, a large fraction of people just did not have access to this technology. So... Uh, uh, Compact proton therapy is an idea meant to make proton therapy more accessible to the masses. It was invented by the founders of my company, not by me. This happened somewhat before I got there. But the idea is fairly straightforward, and here's how we do it in sort of three steps. Uh, we take this existing idea. We start with the cyclotron. We make the cyclotron significantly smaller. Then we take that cyclotron and we stick it directly onto the gantry, just like that, so that we can rotate the cyclotron around the patient. And then we'd get rid of all this other stuff, uh, leaving only the, really the gantry itself with the accelerator mounted directly to it. Uh, I put that in there to be a little cheeky. Uh, like I say, I don't mean to be trash-talking my competitors or anything. This is a, uh, a video I took of a tour we got to take of a very cool facility uh, in the Midwest. This is a proton therapy facility where they actually let us walk the beam line and check out the accelerator room. But I just wanted to give people a sense of the scale of the amount of equipment we're talking about that is used to transport the beam uh, from one room to the other. I, this is a conventional operating facility that treats patients uh, every day. Uh, and just, uh, uh, you know, looking down the beam line, I don't know how much each of these quadrupole magnets uh, cost them. Uh, the number I have in my head is something like a, every time you see one of these magnets, think half a million dollars, half a million dollars, half a million dollars, especially when factoring in all the power supplies and cooling and everything else. Right now I'm looking down the beam line into the treatment room so that the hook around here, the gantries are behind this wall. And if I start this video... It works beautifully. The, uh, the patients that go there are very happy. The doctors that go there, are, that work there, are very happy. But yeah, you have to admit, it's a lot of stuff. So. Uh, here we go. And this is the uh, Mevion system. This is the first, the world's first uh, compact proton therapy system. Uh, and this is it. This fat part in the middle here is the accelerator. The patient is two meters away from the exit of the accelerator. Everything we do uh, to shape the beam has to happen in between that exit and the patient. Uh, the structure here is the gantry with big counterweights to counterbalance the accelerator. These are mostly empty tubes with some electronics and stuff. The whole facility fits in a 30-foot cube, 
Uh, so it's sort of a three-story building. Here's a video of, so this is what the treatment room looks like. There's the robotic couch and the nozzle. And then if you look behind the wall, you'll see this is the accelerator rotating through, in this case, 190 degrees, um, uh, which the patient would never see, but is really right behind the wall um, and is very compact. So, and there we go. There's the nozzle extension. What is that? That's a great question, and it's probably one of the first questions I asked. I actually have a slide in here towards the end about that. Um, uh, but I did want to talk about it, so I'll, 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 re I'll respond to it. So um, the, uh, it seems like one of the most straightforward things. Let's put the patient in a chair or just spin him around, like on a rotisserie or something. Uh, and, irradiate, and that way we don't have to have the big gantry, right? Like, why not? Um, and the truth is that, uh, as an engineer, which I am, um, it seems like that's a very solvable problem. People have been working on that for decades, trying to get uh, immobilization and patient positioning in an upright position so that you can rotate the patient from any angle. And they've, for the most part, failed. It is not something that has been adopted in mainstream uh, clinical practice. Um, and it really comes down to so human-machine interactions. You have to remember that um, what we're talking about is a person, uh, probably a very sick person, possibly a, a kid. And what you're asking them to do is to sit perfectly still and not slouch and slouch exactly the way they slouched the day we took their Im we imaged their tumor um, and then spin around and we're going to treat it from all, all different angles. And for what, there's all kinds of ways that people have tried to immobilize people and give them uh, things to look at or whatever, and um, this, it's been implemented in sort of research settings from, from time to time, uh, but they've never quite been able to make it work. And to me, it's, a, it's kind of an important cautionary tale to remember that at the end of the day, we're building a machine that is meant to, this meant to be designed around people and around the needs of the patients directly. And sometimes those needs are not what you would expect. So what I can say is that people have tried. They haven't, quite made, they haven't figured out how to make it work. They may still. But for now, this is the this is the way this is the way we got to do it. This is a picture of uh, one of our facilities. This is that 30-foot cube. Uh, you see the concrete shielding, just for perspective. So this is an existing hospital that was working during the construction and installation of their proton machine. Uh, this kind of squarish bunker here. This is our machine. This is our bunker, and this picture was taken. This is our accelerator module being lowered in. This actually was the largest crane in Europe. Not because our machine is very heavy; it weighs about 100 tons but because uh, uh, they had to go like park in the parking lot across the street and lift it over this building and drop it into the middle of this courtyard. Uh, another, for perspective though, um, for scale, I like to point out in this picture, this here is a line of conventional X-ray LINAC bunkers. So they have a whole, arrange, a whole line of them here. They had eight bunkers all in a row. And to, to add their proton machine, they carved out one and a half of them, bumped out a little here, and they went up. Uh, but other than that, we're approaching the scale of being able to jam our machine into one of the existing bunkers rather than building a facility that's the size of a football field off-site. Uh, so how do we do this? The first step I said was to shrink the cyclotron. So on the left, that was a, a conventional machine before Compact came along. On the right, that's the Mevion machine. It's a compact 15-ton uh, superconducting synchrocyclotron. Uh, uh, one of the big one of the big ways to do this is to increase the field. Uh, the bigger machine has a two tesla magnetic field. The smaller machine, smaller machine ours has a nine tesla field. Uh, how does one go about this? Well, uh, just a brief interlude on how a cyclotron works. Uh, hopefully, this isn't old territory for everybody. But basically, a cyclotron is a particle accelerator in which you have a large area of mostly uniform magnetic field uh, and an RF signal. Uh, the whole design is based around the fundamental cyclotron frequency of a charged particle. Um, where, which you can get by just by deriving basic physics equations, which I, in fact, learned in this room once upon a time, uh, balancing centripetal acceleration uh, uh, against the um, electrostatic force, and the, or the, main, the Lorentz force. Uh, this is the equation for cyclotron frequency. It goes up with magnetic field uh, and down with mass. And this is an equation for the radius, the Larmor radius. Uh, these two equations tell you two things. Uh, one is that uh, relativity is going to be kind of a pain in the butt, and the other is that if you want to make your cyclotron smaller, you've got to increase the magnetic field. Uh, why do I say that about relativity? 
Uh, that's because if it weren't for the relativistic uh, mass sh shift, um, the, you would be able to drive your cyclotron at just one frequency. So the cyclotron frequency, uh, the more uh, energy the particles got, the longer their path would be, they would always come back at the same time. Uh, and that would be a, a simple machine indeed. Um, but uh, above a certain energy, maybe one MeV, ten, something like that, uh, that's going to stop working uh, as, the, as the, the mass of the particle shifts due to relativity. And much of the design of uh, how cyclotrons are built is built is how we address that uh, feature. So uh, the, it once was the time that the conventional machine, the way they addressed this problem was to tailor the magnetic field with radius. So uh, as the particle gets uh, relativistically heavier, you increase the magnetic field uh, to compensate, and you can always maintain uh, the same driving frequency. Uh, this works uh, pretty well, except for one complexity, which is uh, about axial focusing. By what you really want uh, in order to maintain your beam in the median plane of your accelerator uh, is a magnetic field that's shaped like this. You want to decrease the magnetic field as you go out with radius so that you get the appropriate curvature to redirect uh, uh, axial velocity back down towards the center. Uh, this is exactly the opposite of what you want to do if you're going to try to tailor the magnetic field to account for relativity in what's called an isochronous machine, which does not mean you're sunk. It means you have to do something a little more complicated. Uh, so that rather than using uh, the, the dbdz dr to do focusing, you have to do the, use the azimuthal field. So to build an isochronous machine, which is tailoring the magnetic field to keep up with the uh, protons, you add these funny spiral-shaped structures which introduce azimuthal non-uniformities and get you focusing in, the, in that plane. Um, and um, this works quite well, actually. Uh, isochronous machines were a workhorse for not just proton uh, accelerators, but for all kinds of industrial accelerators and other applications. The RF structure is simple because you can still drive it at a, a constant frequency. That means you get a CW beam. You can get a ton of current out of a machine like this. Uh, but, for this per but for this purpose, you're fundamentally limited. If you want to increase the magnetic field to make the machine much smaller at a given energy, uh, there's only so far you can go before the steel or iron you use to build your azimuthally very, uh, your AVF structures uh, saturates and just doesn't help you anymore. You get diminishing returns above about two tesla or something like that. If you want to build a nine tesla machine, um, isochronous is just not going to work. So what you have to do is you have to go the other way. People uh, uh, deal with relativity. Rather than tailoring the magnetic field with radius, you sweep the frequency in time. Make a pulse machine called a synchrocyclotron. Uh, and that's what we've done here. So here we tailor the magnetic field that we like for focusing. Um, we turn the magnetic field way, way up. And now we build an RF structure that sweeps in time to get a burst of protons. Uh, and this is kind of what that RF structure looks like. These are the D electrodes across which we push the RF voltage. This is a uh, rotating capacitor which mechanically varies the resonance of this structure so that we can sweep the RF driving frequency um, very fast over and over again and put high power in. Uh, what you're looking at here is uh, the iron around the accelerator and you can see the back of the RF uh, protruding out of it. Um, a synchrocyclotron inherently will be able to produce less current than the best isochronous machine you can deliver. But there's no fundamental limit in how high you can make the magnetic field. Um, and just because it produces less current doesn't mean it can't produce the amount of current you need for this application. Like I said, we only need one nanoamp in the treatment room, which is actually not that much. Uh, and this is kind of what the time structure looks like. We sweep the uh, 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 FM frequency. We tune the AM envelope so that we put more or less RF voltage depending on where the protons are as they go through the structure. As we sweep down, you get a burst of protons out every time. An inherently pulse machine. Uh, uh, but one that does the job and can be made very small. Uh, the other way to make it small, of course, is to make a very strong magnetic field using superconducting magnets. Uh, our superconductor we run about two, is designed to run about 2,000 amps, in fact, go up to about 250 MeV uh, accelerator. Uh, that's a 9 tesla in the bore in the median plane of the accelerator. In the coils, it's more like 12 tesla. We have an onboard cryogenic system, which cools to 4K. Um, and another important point here that's unique to this machine is that you not only have to build this magnet, you have to build the whole accelerator in a way that as you move through gravity to different angles and the coil shifts relative to the iron, you have to maintain the exact same relationship uh, of the coils to the iron so that you get the same beam out. So a lot of engineering went into not just making the support stiff so that the coil stays aligned relative to the iron, but in fact adapt adaptively positions itself 
so we always get the same beam at any angle, which I think is a pretty unique problem. I can't think of too many other applications where you're swinging an accelerator around the room like this. Okay, uh, here's one of those fancy marketing slides I promised. Uh, this is the all of the things we're, we do to the beam after it comes out of the accelerator. So uh, what you can see here is this nice rendering with all like this reflections coming off the couch. What you see here are the scanning magnet, the dosimetry, the our energy selection system, uh, and a collimation system. Uh, I wanted to show this, which is a picture of what it actually looked like in a research vault when we built the first prototype. Um, and the point I really wanted to make here was that the accelerator is two meters away from the patient, so everything that we're going to do to turn that proton beam into a three-dimensional conformal treatment has to fit in a space about this big. Um, and that's what it looks like in the, in, the, uh, in the real vault. This is our research vault back in Littleton. Uh, so just kind of going through these one at a time. We have a scanning magnet bolted directly to the accelerator. Uh, we pass seven or 800 amps uh, through these coils to direct uh, the beam in two, in two directions, X and Y, to whichever spot we want. Uh, uh, this is two sets of coils wrapped around each other in so-called cosine theta arrangement, uh, designed to be as compact as possible and also iron-free so there's no hysteresis in it. We can sweep it very fast. And this is just an example of what it looks like when we move the beam to different spots uh, and very accurately positioned to within less than a millimeter. Dosimetry is an important part of the system. Uh, that's this whole part living right in here. It's a set of transmission ion chambers that uh, don't, d don't interfere with the beam but allow us to detect uh, charge in each pulse, uh, the spot sh size and shape, uh, the um, trajectory by plotting through two sets of chambers, uh, and it's also used to do active dose control. So we have to very accurately deliver a certain amount of charge to a certain spot. The amount of charge we get in a certain pulse coming out of the ion source in our accelerator varies by a lot, actually, as much as 40% out of any one pulse. So we do active control by measuring each pulse and adjusting the target for the next one. So we exactly hit the target at every spot. Um, the whole system is set up to be very safe. We measure every single pulse. If something doesn't look right, we simply don't deliver the next pulse, interrupt the treatment, and go check and figure out what, what went wrong. Uh, energy modulation is something I spent, I personally spent a lot of time working on. It's actually, in principle, a very simple device. Uh, earlier I talked about degraders. If you want to go 32 centimeters in water, you have a 230 MeV beam. If you want to go only 20 centimeters in water, well, all you have to do is put 12 centimeters worth of stuff in front of the beam, and it won't go so far. Um, if we had a long beam line, just putting stuff in the beam isn't sufficient because the quality of the beam gets really lousy, and you're never uh, going to uh, transport it. But we don't have a long beam line. We're going to put our energy selection right next to the patient. Um, so uh, we can keep it very simple. So what you see here is just an arrangement of 18 Lexan plates. Uh, and depending on how many of them we put in the beam, uh, we, the energy coming out of the beam changes. Uh, what you see here are the Bragg peaks for a range of energies going to different depths. This is 32 centimeters, and this is probably uh, uh, 3 or 5 centimeters. Uh, what you see is that using this technique, uh, the Bragg peak width doesn't change. You have the exact same Bragg peak at all energies. But the other thing you can see from this graph is that uh, these plots are not normalized. So we do lose some intensity on that Bragg peak as we put more and more material in the beam, but not that much. At worst, it's like 80% efficient. So whereas the conventional energy selection system, you're throwing away 99% or more of your protons. Uh, and this is, a, this is a pretty important feature of the Mevion system. It's why we can make a machine that produces one nanoamp of current and put it right next to the patient um, and have it be safe to not generate a ton of neutron radiation, to not generate a ton of uh, activation. Um, the other nice feature uh, of doing energy modulation this way is that it's very fast. Uh, we don't have to ramp magnets up and down or anything like that. These plate, you put a plate in, that's the only thing that needs to change to change the energy. And in fact, we do it even faster. We developed a technique we call, I come up with some fancy words, scan synchronous layer switching. But the idea here is we don't want to wait for the plate to be all the way in the beam before we start delivering the beam. So we start the plate moving and then we arrange the spots in the treatment plan so that we can deliver its beam as soon as the plate is in motion. So what we have here is an experiment we set up where we took a little um, DJ laser light show thing, uh, which ha happens to have the exact same control signal as our scanning magnet, pointed the laser at the, uh, at the rain shifting plates here, uh, and then ran a plan and what you can see here is that the plate starts moving, the beam starts scanning. It does not wait for the plate to go all the way in. Uh, so we have very, very short layer switching times. It's 50 milliseconds as compared to like a one to two seconds. Um, 
which is why the marketing guys came up with the name uh, Hyperscan. Uh, sure, it gets activated, but uh, not as much as you think. And uh, we cho choose materials um, to, uh, to minimize that. And ultimately, we just don't produce that much beam current. You know, we produce about as many protons as you need to deliver to the patient, and that's kind of it. Um, uh, we get a lot of questions like that. But uh, this is a cool experiment we did uh, where we just put a tank of liquid scintillator in front of the beam. You can see the camera there. This is the display from that camera. We try to go, uh, because we have this very fast layer switching, uh, we can deliver a volumetric treatment very quickly. So this is a, a treatment where we showed we can deliver a one liter volume in six seconds, which is pretty fast for the industry standard. What you're looking at here is the beam is scanning left, right, in and out of the page, which you can't see, and then the slow axis is, down, uh, is up and down. Uh, so you see it scans a layer, it jumps to another layer, it scans that layer, uh, and moves back and forth. Uh, it jumps around in sequence a little bit because of the way we do this layer switching where the plates move down on one layer and up on the next. So you have to move like two in and then one out and two in and one out, and that causes the beam to jump around in depth like this. The last thing in the beamline is uh, a collimation device we call the adaptive aperture. Um, it's an example of a, of a class of device called a multi-leaf collimator. Uh, and um, uh, is very unique to the Mevion system. So this is, in, in some ways, uh, a really neat feature. It's in, so, in some ways, it's a mitigation to the energy selection approach we've chosen because by putting the rain shifting plates right next to the patient, the beam scatters, the spot size gets big. You, it makes it very difficult to get sharp gradients, especially as you get far away from the patient. So this is a device meant to trim the edges of the field so you can get uniform dose to the tumor, a sharp gradient, and very little dose to the organ at risk. So what we're looking at here is a series of leaves. There's 14 uh, nickel leaves meant to, each one has the capacity to totally stop the beam. Uh, they move with the scanned proton beam uh, around in the field. They can trim any spot anywhere in the field to any shape. So over here you'll see an animation of what the leaves are going to do, and over here a Monte Carlo calculation of what the dose will look like cumulatively as this plan is delivered. This is just one layer of a sphere, so it's going to look like a circle kind of with a hole in the middle. And what you see is that as the leaves trim the outside, you get a nice sharp edge, and then in the middle where we don't want it to be sharp, we want it to be uniform, uh, we don't use the leaves, and uh, we get a nice uniform dose in there. Uh, this is actually kind of an old video from the early conceptual days of when we were designing this thing, but it still, I think, does a good job of illustrating. ...of adaptive IMPT are clear. Exact collimation eliminates dose uncertainty at the lateral edge of the target and delivers less dose to healthy tissue. And you can see if we use this again here. Of adaptive IMPT are clear. Exact collimation eliminates dose uncertainty at the lateral edge of the target. The device is uh, 17 axes of motion, 14 leaves. Uh, we developed, uh, so the, I do kind of a little interpretive dance up here to explain how it works, but there's one big axis which moves the whole thing up and down. These two blocks move left and right on independent carriages. Each leaf is actuated on, an own, on its own linear motor uh, so that in principle we can, kind of, we can go anywhere in the field and trim any spot. It's a custom array of linear motors we, we built just for this purpose. That's what it looks like when it, in real life when it's running through a treatment. So again, meant only to trim the very edges of the field, so only a small fraction of the protons are, tr are trimmed. Uh, we get a lot of questions of, boy, don't these leaves get activated? Doesn't this get radioactive? What, what about all the neutrons? But we're only trimming a very small fraction of the protons, so uh, it really turns out not to be a, an issue. And just uh, a quick, this is a film we put in. It shows exactly how sharp you can get your gradient uh, when you use collimation. Uh, oh, and one more cool thing. When using a, the adaptive aperture, you can do all kinds of dose distributions you couldn't otherwise do in this case. Uh, uh, the donut where you imagine there was a block of metal floating in the middle of space, you can, you can trim out the interior of this field and you can see how much sharper it gets when you trim versus when you don't. So um, I just wanted to touch briefly on the imaging and clinical workflow. Uh, so what we're watching here is uh, we did all this engineering. We designed this compact machine uh, that uh, can position the, point the beam very, very precisely. We have this complicated robot that can position the patient very, very precisely. But in the end, the, the real challenge is that the patient itself um, is a squishy ball of goo who doesn't really want to sit still. And so a big part of the clinical workflow is that as the patient comes in, they're immobilized on the table, they are scanned and imaged in situ right there while they're on the, on the table. Uh, a computer does a bunch of fancy math to calculate exactly what they have to do to shift this table in six dimensions 
to get it exactly positioned the way it's supposed to be for the treatment plan, uh, then the patient is moved into place to that exact position and the beam is delivered, often multiple fields in one setting. Um, so um, I think a, the real positive uh, sort of, this isn't the end of the story, but the sort of the, the exciting part of the story is that, uh, so there's the Mevion machine on the left. Uh, Mevion invented compact proton therapy, but we're not the only ones who do it. In fact, now across the industry, these are all the three big vendors you might find in proton therapy. Everybody has a compact solution. Um, and as a result, um, I think that uh, we're going to start to see this technology really getting out there uh, to more and more people. Um, and I do mean this sincerely. Uh, the marketing guys put this slide together to show that our system is smaller than the other guys' systems. But uh, my takeaway from this is that um, the industry as a whole is really moving in a positive direction. And I kind of feel like, in some sense, although these are our competitors, we are collaborating to really do something that's going to benefit people. Uh, and this is just some statistics over the last few years. Uh, when you look at sales, not, not machines that are being built, because that's a, a backlog of several years behind. Uh, but from multi-room single systems to single-room systems, over the last few years, you've seen a larger and larger share of them. And in the last year, there were no multi-room systems sale, sold in the world, and it's all been uh, single-room systems. Uh, I'd like to say that we've reached the point where there's a, now a proton therapy system in the back of every office park, uh, and anybody who needs it can get it. We're definitely not there yet. Uh, there's still only about like 80 machines in the world. Um, but I, uh, but, and you can look at this graph of like how many proton centers there were in the world versus time and look at the point at which compact was introduced and see that, oh, maybe the, the growth is really happening. Uh, I, think, I think there's still really room to, go, to grow. Um, but um, I'm really excited about the future. And one thing I did want to talk about was one of our customers. This is Dr. Ackerman at the Ackerman Cancer Center in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, he is the world's first private practice to buy a proton therapy machine. Uh, he bought it himself. I think he mortgaged his house. Uh, he is not uh, a large research hospital in a major uh, urban center. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look just over, if you were, uh, before this picture was cropped, if you look just over there, this is the parking lot of a Walmart in Jacksonville. And I believe if you're driving down I-95 in Jacksonville, you'll see billboard advertisement, advertisements for proton therapy. You can come get your cancer treated at the Ackerman Cancer Center. Um, and to me, this is the sense that it, uh, Ackerman himself is kind of an early adopter, but this, this is uh, an indication that there's going to be a new kind of customer, a, a new kind of facility, uh, a new kind of adopter. Uh, we're, we're pushing this technology along the adopt, uh, adoption curve to a place where it will be accessible to more and more people. Um, and to me, that's very satisfying, and, uh, and I'm, I'm very glad to have played the, the small role that I have uh, in this development. So uh, I have a couple of slides on like hot topics and proton therapy. I, we're kind of out of time, so maybe I'll just end it there. And, um, and I'll just say, like, uh, once again, I appreciate your guys' attention. Uh, it's been a huge thrill for me to be here uh, back in my old haunts. Um, and um, and um, just thank you very much, and I'll take any more questions. Uh, no, Loma Linda is the closest, which I think is in yeah. San Diego. That was actually the first commercial proton center. Uh, but there's not so many in California. I don't think there's any in the Bay Area at all. There's, I think there's some being built, but not yet. This question there. Um, how big does the tumor have to be to be treated with one of these machines, and how much does it cost? Uh, how much does it cost per patient? Uh, per I uh, oh, for a course of therapy? So um, those are both good questions. Uh, in terms of the size, uh, typically, um, uh, I think for various reasons, uh, the smallest we see is about three centimeters is a tumor. So that's not the smallest. Like a metastasis will see it will be much smaller, and there might be many of them. That, you might use a different technique for, for just doing something that small. Um, but we see three centimeters all the way up to, like, liters. Yeah, yeah, Some, maybe a little smaller than that, actually, but yeah. Um, in terms of how much does it cost, uh, I think it varies a lot depending on what state and what your like um, insurance reimbursements are about. Uh, and so I'm not going to quote a number because I have some numbers in my head, but I, I don't want to just throw one out there. It's, uh, protons are obviously more expensive than photons. That's, that's the crux of the problem.
right? And that's what we're trying to address. Mm -mm. It's all purely, it's just a photon with a plasma, it's a term that, you know, excites and gets the... Yeah, it, it comes across as physical dose, but you're right, there's no nuclear interactions yeah, there. Exactly. Yeah. The other question I had is, uh, um, you know, I've got 220 or so MEV in that range. The photon photon cross-section is over 10 to the minus 30 square meters, uh, which is 10 to the minus 26, so it has, let's say, Uh, yes. So, yeah, it is a complicated path. It's more complicated pathway than I let on. In fact, often the there's not there's not just there's not just gammas and other products. There's complicated chemistry having to do with the oxygen radicals and stuff like that. And so, so uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. In fact, they use uh, they use the prompt gammas as a range. Well, there's research into using the prompt gamma radiation as a range verification technique. It's one of the things I ran out of time talking about, but. Uh, you shoot the proton beam into a person, you don't get to look and see where it goes. And there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in the integrated path length of the, the, the path to get there. And so a, one of the hot topics is how can we verify where this Bragg peak really stopped? And one of the most common techniques is to use prompt gamma to, to look at... That's a good question. Um, the, and uh, so, first of all, I guess what you're talking about would really be a surface technique. Uh, and there are technologies out there that do that. Uh, so just looking at surface imaging and you look at IR and all kinds of stuff. Um, there are people out there who have argued that you would, you can infer internal anatomy based on the surface. But yeah, so what you would use that technology for is more about like, you know, the patient's breathing, right? If you're treating a lung tumor, it's moving up and down and up and down, well, quite a bit. And if you can localize that, um, uh, you can get a much tighter dose distribution around the tumor. So you, people use surface tracking for gating, which means I'm going to wait till their breath is in a certain phase and deliver it right then. Or tracking where you actually steer the beam. No one's doing tracking with protons yet, but I bet that will, that's coming. Uh, but people also use x-ray technologies for that as well. So you can do, you can do real time radiographic imaging. In, uh, you mean like as a planning technique to figure out how to get the, uh, yeah. So, um, the treatment planning, I didn't talk much about it. Uh, much progress has been made in recent years. And once upon a time, there was a ton of really smart people uh, doing analytical models on how to do dose distributions uh, and also optimization algorithms. Uh, but the industry is actually moving more towards um, a Monte Carlo dose distributions, uh, dose calculations these days. And so the modern treatment planning systems, I mean, it's all, they're commercial software, so it's kind of under the hood. You don't really know what they're doing, but they have complicated uh, optimization algorithms for the spots and energies, and then really sophisticated Monte Carlo dose distributions that integrate along the, the whole the CT path. Any last question, Bruce? How loud is the machine? Well, you don't hear the protons. Uh, the loudest thing is actually the cryo coolers that are mounted on the outside of the accelerator, and they make, what, in my opinion, kind of a pleasant white noise chugga chugga sound like the dryer. The dryer, you put your baby on the dryer and it falls asleep. Uh, some of the mechanical stuff, the adaptive aperture and the, the plates, you can hear those moving around. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's the most comfortable environment, but people aren't really complaining. So, you know. All right, well, maybe we'll stop it there. Uh, thanks again. All right. Thank you.